Welcome, everyone. It's just shy of 11.30 a.m. here on the West Coast. And we have Helen Erlen, Executive Director of the Erlen Institute and creator of the Erlen Method here today, talking about how the environment is putting your brain at risk. In other words, toxic brain environments. We're going to have time for a question and answer, live question and answer with Helen at the end of her talk. So be sure that you post any questions you might have in the comment section below the video as it's going on, and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. With that said, welcome Helen, and I'm going to turn this broadcast over to you. Lovely, thank you, Sandra, I appreciate that. Some of you who are seeing me live, it's, I, I always, I have some children who come in every once in a while and look at me and go, wow, you mean she's still alive? <laughs> so it's nice to be doing a live podcast and welcome all of you. One of the main reasons that I wanted to talk about Erlen in relationship to the environment and the emotions and the other areas that we work with is because we're so focused on reading that we forget all the other issues that the brain interprets in the same way as they interpret reading, which gets us to the point of the brain, because we seem to forget how important the brain is. If I can quote Dan Amen, your brain is your most important organ. It controls how you think, how you feel, how you act, your performance, your sustained attention and concentration, and in addition, your health and well-being. So I wanna show you that Erlen is related to the brain and calming the brain down and giving you peak performance with your brain. And we'll be talking more about the brain. So first thing though you need to know and understand about the brain is that everyone has their own unique brain. Just like we have all have unique fingerprints and every snowflake is uniquely different. So is everybody's brain uniquely different. Therefore, Erlen has customized colors for each individual's particular brain. Um, and you're going to see what your brain wants you to see. So one size does not fit all. And you see what your brain wants you to see. And that some people's brain, when they're under certain environmental conditions, are not perceiving things accurately. And that's what we're going to talk about. But the part of the brain that's so important for Erlen is the visual cortex. And that's right in the back of your brain. We seem to forget about the visual cortex because if your eyes are open, the concept is it's always on. And you don't think about it being overactive or hyperactive or interfering and creating other parts of the brain to be overactive. But the visual cortex has the largest real estate in the brain and it doesn't even like to stay inactive. So there was an interesting research study that they did with people who were blind who were reading Braille, thinking that the part of the brain that would be activated would be the tactile part, but it wasn't. It was the visual cortex. Your visual cortex has got to take over and it's really important. Another aspect to the visual cortex is that it doesn't have neuroplasticity. So like other parts of the brain where you can train and do repetition and that's going to make a change or improvement. That's not how the visual cortex works. And especially in relationship to Erlen, because in some ways, even though we're calming the brain down, we're not doing that by changing the visual cortex. We're changing the signals at which the visual cortex re reaches the brain so it can be processed by the brain, okay? So color can change your brain. If you heard yesterday's um, presentation, um, their research is definitely showing that color can change the brain. 
So let's start out and go from the beginning. Visual information is not read by your eyes. Don't tell optometrists that. <laughs> but your visual system goes from your eyes to your brain. And the eyes of the camera that takes that visual information and puts it on places that on the right part of the retina. So it can go to the optic nerve, which then takes those signals to the visual cortex where it has to be read and processed. So what is your visual cortex processing? Well, visual information, if you put light, if you've taken physics and you put it through a prism, it breaks out into all the colors of the rainbow, traveling at different speeds. And some of those colors or wavelengths of light, the timing is off. So by the time it has to re it reaches the visual uh, cortex and is being processed by the visual cortex, it's like static for the visual cortex. And that's creating what we call distortions, but are really very similar to optical illusions, a whole array of physical symptoms, and then an array of ensuing difficulties. So there's a lot of things that are connected and interpreted exactly the same way by your visual cortex. So your visual cortex is, and your brain is the most important organ you have. <laughs> you want the best possible brain you have for peak performance, right? And having a brain that's overactive is going to create difficulties, not just with reading, but with a whole array of other problems, such as copying, math calculations, answer sheets. Um, it creates problems in terms of being able to look and see things accurately on especially whiteboards, computer screens, iPads, iPhones, all your mechanical devices today, and under fluorescent lighting, especially. Bright lights, fluorescent lights become a problem glare, headlights at, at night, they're all interpreted exactly the same way by the brain. And I want to talk about, before I go on, because I always find it really important, we haven't talked about it much, is the array of physical symptoms that can be triggered. Because the visual cortex, A, talks to other parts of the brain, such as the lateral genicular bodies and vagus ganglia. Um, Adam referred to the fact that it activates other parts of the brain and including the autonomic nervous system, which triggers another whole array of physical symptoms. So I kind of listed them because we think about Erlen, we think about eye pain and eye strain and a lot of people with headaches and migraines, but also nauseous and dizziness, tiredness and fatigue. But what we don't talk about is the fact that when it's triggering the autonomic nervous system, you can have anxiety, irritability, fidgetiness, nervousness, feelings of panic, that there are other parts of the brain that are going to create brain fog, disorientation, feeling lightheaded, feeling exhausted, nervous, fight or flight, and difficulties with concentration and focusing. That's a huge array of physical symptoms that can be triggered. And a lot of these people are being misdiagnosed, especially with anxiety and depression. Um, I'll give you one example is a college student who came to me. She did very well throughout her school career, got into a very good college, had gotten A's her whole life until she went to college. And within the first semester, of being in college, she felt like she was almost a year behind in terms of the reading and couldn't keep up. And it created all kinds of symptoms, especially she was diagnosed and brought home and diagnosed with anxiety and depression and placed on medication. Somehow she got to see us at the Erlen Institute. Um, and what we found out for her is obviously she had made it through the K through high school system doing a minimal amount of reading and was really bright, picked up her information by listening and from lectures 
and she was able to compensate even if she may not have done so well on tests by doing all her homework and participating in class, except for those strategies do not work when you go to college. And she crashed. She couldn't keep up with the amount of reading. Once we got her in the filters and she realized that she can now read without having to build breaks in order to reset her brain. And every time you take a break, your breaks get longer and the amount of time you read gets shorter. <laughs> that she could sit in class and concentrate under the fluorescent lighting. And that life was different once she was wearing her Earl and Spectral filters. She was able to go back to college and do very well in college. Um, you know, and, and I get story after story, and they're not stories, they're real people. We had a high school student who started having headaches when she was in elementary school. And she told the nurse sent her home, and she kept being sent home because she'd go to the nurse's office with headaches. She was looked at and had her vision tested. She was looked at by her pediatrician. She saw a neurologist. She had a brain scan. Nothing. They couldn't find anything at all. So they just assumed that she was trying to get out of class and not do the work. So she stopped complaining, and people thought her headaches went away. She just, why bother to tell people that you have a headache? So she stopped complaining. About middle school sometime, her headaches got worse and worse. And finally, by the end of middle school, she was having not just headaches, she was having migraines. And with her migraines, she would get nauseous and dizzy. Then she was in high school. Now, you have to realize this is a child who really wanted to succeed and do well. So she didn't stop reading. She couldn't get out from her environment. Um, and so her headaches became migraines, and they got worse and worse. And all she wanted to do was to stop her migraines and stop her headaches. So she got a hold of some pills um, and took too many and realized, though, she didn't want to kill herself. So called her father, who rushed home, and they rushed her to the hospital and pumped her stomach. And she survived. And somehow or other, they got a, oh, I know what happened. So then she went back to school again. She was put on medication and saw the school psychologist who was a screener and Cheryl Deeds is now an Erlen diagnostician and who identified this as Erlen sent her to us, has her own spectral filters and she has no more headaches and no more migraines and she continued to be successful in school. So just to give you a few of the populations we work with who have very different needs. Um, in terms of the visual cortex, which we are now doing research, you saw that with Cornell University, and we've done other brain studies. Some of you have seen the SPECT scans. So you're very aware that when the brain or the visual cortex becomes hyperactive or overactive, that it cannot function well. And that shows up on these scans where you'll see a hot brain indicated by the red area, but it's also triggering a whole array of other areas, triggering a whole array of physical symptoms. So what are the environments that are triggering this? Because we're talking about a toxic environment. Fluorescent lights are a big one. Bright lights, computer screens because they're backlit, iPads, iPhones, tablets. High contrast, black on white. Now think about it. We used to have blackboards with white print, and that was fine. Green boards were pretty good as long as you didn't use yellow chalk. And now what do we have? Whiteboards. We have computer screens that have gotten brighter and brighter. We have fluorescent lights. We're going to go into LED lighting, which gets brighter and brighter. And people say, well, why, who have Erlen, do we have this kind of environment if it's so bad for us? 
What I want to say is the fact that the majority of the population is not bothered by these environmental stressors at all. And they're the majority of the population. You're living in their world because their world is not stressful. <clears throat> not stressful at all. They like fluorescent lighting. It feels the same whether they're under it or in not under it. They like high contrast. Matter of fact, when we try to change the color contrast by putting different colors down, <clears throat> none of the colors make a difference, but it all makes it harder for them to read. And they read the quickest, the best, best under high contrast, black on white. You live in their world. And then the other issue that we find, and um, I heard it two weeks ago, was you don't know what you don't know. So most people assume that what they're experiencing is normal and everyone else experiences the same thing. So how would they know or identify that they have a problem, even if their behavior is really drastically different? I'm thinking about <laughs> one law student whose sister made her come because her scores went from C's to A's when she was in the Earl and Filters. And he said to her, hey, I'm bright. You were the one who had C's. I'm in law school. I don't have a problem at all. Well, he took the bar and failed it once. He took it again and failed it twice. Now he better do something because he only had one more chance to pass the bar. So his family brought him in, his sister on one side, his dad on the other side. And when I asked him to describe to me what reading is like, he said, well, yeah, I read and after a page I start getting tired, so I start drinking coffee. And then by a chapter I'm drinking coffee nonstop, but I can't keep my eyes open. So this is what he would do to read. He would hold his eyelids open so that they wouldn't close. And to him, he thought that was normal, right? <laughs> so the end of that was the fact, yes, he was a candidate for Erlen. Yes, he was in Erlen filters. Yes, he could take the bar exam and do it under fluorescent lighting and passed. So congratulations to him. But even as dramatic as having to hold your eyelids open and think that was normal. Um, we've had other individuals who came in and I had a whole family where two of the children were diagnosed as having agoraphobia because they wouldn't leave their rooms. When I asked them what their rooms were like, they said, well, they painted their walls black. They had shades on the window, but that wasn't dark enough, so they put black curtains over the windows. And I said to them, what happens when you leave your room? Because that felt calm and comfortable. And they said, the minute we walk out and we're hit by light, we get headaches and migraines, nauseous and dizzy, anxious, and we just go right back into our rooms. And again, they were medically diagnosed as having agoraphobia. And even dad didn't know that lighting was creating such a problem for them. Um, in addition to lighting, colors and patterns, certain colors, your brighter colors create problems. Even black and white can be too bright for some individuals. Certain patterns, stripes, plaids and polka dots change and move. Every time I go into a hotel room when we do a conference and I do you ever look down at the carpeting and they have these horrible patterns on the carpeting. And I think, why do they do that? Why are they doing that? You know, my population goes, oh, my God, I feel dizzy and it's hard to walk down <laughs> the um, corridors. So I finally asked somebody and they said, well, they do that so they know how to place the furniture. And I thought, OK, they have a reason for doing it, but it's sure awful for those who have Erlen, and I keep saying, we live in that world. Um, you know, you can inherit this brain, so you can blame somebody, either your mom or dad, and they can blame their mom or their dad, um, but you can inherit it as well. 
So we see a large population that have had head injuries, concussions, whiplash. We work with NFL football players, professional ice hockey players, kids who have concussions from wrestling, from football, from a variety of sports. I always quote Dan Amen, who says, the only safe sport is ping pong. <laughs> we have now seen 500 of the Marines who have been on active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and experienced blast injuries um, and head injuries and live, have been living with headaches every minute of every day, never being pain free, that become migraines once to twice a day to twice a week. They are on sometimes by the time we see them on three migraine medications, Botox injections every three months or three weeks, um, and medications for anxiety and irritability, sometimes as many as five, 15 medications. Um, they're anxious, they're irritable, they're depressed, they can't think, they can't pull their thoughts together, they can't function on top of all of the physical symptoms that they're experiencing. And, and we have, again, using the technology of just changing and filtering out specific wavelengths of light that their brain is having difficulty processing. And for each of those wavelengths of light that we have to filter, we have to independently figure out how much we need to filter it. We've been able to eliminate totally their headaches and their migraines, their dizziness, their nausea. Um, they feel like they have a future because they can now read longer than one word or one paragraph. They can go back to school again. Um, they don't feel the same anxiety or irritability. I had and anger even. I had one wife and I was, we do follow-ups and I was on the phone with one of the Marines and I said, well, your anger on a scale of one to five was at a five plus, where is it now? And his wife says, I gotta tell Helen. And he said, his anger was so bad that I would have to take the children, hide in, in a closet and lock ourselves away from him. And she said, you know what? With the Earl and Spectral filters, we don't have to do that anymore. So you get to change. We change lives every day by calming down the brain, which is a lovely thing to do. Um, and just coming back to how important that brain is. So I want to again read the physical symptoms because you may not be aware of them that Erlen can trigger and you can have one or more of them. Anxiety, eye pain or strain, headaches, nauseous, dizziness, migraines, feeling tired, sleepy, fatigued. And when your brain is, let me stop with fatigue for a minute because when your brain is overstressed like that and your brain is stressed, that affects and you're under stress that affects your health and well-being, and that's really important. So you don't want to feel tired or sleepy or stressed. It can also create anger, irritability, nervousness, feeling fidgety, panic, brain fog, feeling disoriented, lightheaded, exhausted, nervous, and an inability to concentrate and focus. That's a long list of possible symptoms that people are living with and just don't know that life can be better. We always talk about the activities that are being created by a toxic environment for those with Erlen. Um, and we talk about obviously reading and math calculation, how it can affect spelling and writing because visual processing allows you to acquire skills and it allows you to retain them and to utilize your skills. And when that visual processing is being disrupted because of Erlen, then it affects the acquisition, retention, and ability to utilize your skills, which affects a lot of academic tasks. And even reading and playing music, it will affect 
interestingly enough, driving especially, and driving at night, tracking moving objects, which can also affect sports performance, especially ball sports. Even learning how to ride a bike and riding a bike can be affected. Um, sitting in class and listening under fluorescent lights. So many of our clients talk about the fact, well, yeah, I daydream, thinking it's their fault. And they're not just attentive enough. No, they're daydreaming because of the lighting that we live on, remember, because of the majority of the population. It can even affect your ability to think and to communicate. And we see that with the uh, population who have autism and on the autism spectrum, and we work a lot with that population as well. Um, Note-taking. And you can see it play itself out, too, in terms of behavioral outbursts. Kids who are resisting to do work, kids who live in dark rooms and adults. I mean, watch the behaviors because the behaviors really are, they're a symptom of something's going on and they're under too much stress. And this is how the symptom is playing itself out. So Erlen can affect performance, ability to function, health and well-being, and your quality of life. That's a large check sheet of things that can be helped or improved with Erlen spectral filters. And the sad part of it is you're never going to get things changed. Remember, Erlen's not the majority of the population. They get their way. They're, you're living in their environment. So Erlen's just equalizing the playing field so you can function as well and as with no stress or less stress as they do. So let me see what else we want to talk about because we don't have much time. So we do have time for some questions at this point, Sandy, so far. Okay. So if any of you, I'll take a second to look over some things I wanted to mention. If any of you have any questions, Nobody has any questions. Oh, my goodness. I always worry if I presented things right, if you have no many questions. I will say that we are... I have one question for you here at the moment. Jenny Marie wants to know why, since she got her lenses, she's experiencing other issues that she'd never noticed before. Uh, for example, being hypersensitive to noise and fidgeting more than she used to. Um, she's wondering if this is related to the lenses and the brain waves in some way. Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Fidg fidgeting, I, that to me would say I'm, I'm not quite sure. There is a real connection between what you see and what you hear. Um, we see it demonstrated in extreme examples within the autistic population where you can have noise sensitivity, by the way. Um, you can have difficulty modulating your environment, not just lighting, but sound, touch, and taste. And those are all on the extreme in the autistic, um, pop with the autistic population. And some of those can be extreme, and you may not have noticed it before because your other issues were taking over. And now that once you've calmed down the visual system and the visual cortex, now you're noticing that you have other sensitivities as well. And there is a real connection between them. We have another question. Annie wants to know how you discovered all of this. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> okay. Um, years and years ago, <laughs> I was a school psychologist and doing all the standardized testing and the psychoeducational testing that you do to identify children so that they can receive special services. Um, and what became very evident to me is that my tests, the testing that we do, did not identify all of the children who were still struggling. The teachers would drag me into the classroom and say, great. You can't identify that this child has any problem. Sit here and watch what happens in the classroom and you tell me what to do next. Um, so over the 
time period, it was it A, became very obvious that we weren't asking all the questions that we need to ask. And two, because for 15 years, I tracked these children through elementary, middle, and high school, that if you don't address it, it stays with an individual for a lifetime. And I was lucky enough at this point where it was really critical for me saying, what else do we, questions do we need to ask? What are we missing? That I was asked to start a program for adults with learning disabilities at a four year campus. And that was a great, I had the population I needed to work with. It was a population of adults who were highly motivated, who um, were working two to three to four times harder to, to get into college and to stay in college. And the fact that you couldn't blame it on maturation or motivation. And we sat down and I said to them, because they had all were bright, so they all had been tested and they knew I was a school psychologist and a therapist and they didn't want any more testing. And I agreed with them because what we do in education is we don't ask the person what their problem is, we tell them. And then we never go back <clears throat> and say to them, is this real? Does this play itself out in real life? Like a lot of the, I hear, because the buzzword today is auditory processing and auditory difficulties. And I go back and I talk to the adults and children and I say, any problems picking up information in the classroom? No. I use my listening skills. I depend on my listening skills. Any difficulty with, you know, phonics? No, I have my phonics down. That was quick and that was easy. So we never ask in terms of real life, how are these labels playing themselves out? So I said, we're going to do this differently. I'm not going to test you. And they all did, gave a real sigh of relief. And I said, I want to ask you what it's like for you. And what I found is it's how you ask your questions. And I got better at asking my questions as I talked with the adult population. And some key questions I learned to ask as we first were dealing with reading was tell me what reading is like for you. And nobody has ever asked them that. Tell me what reading is like for you, not when you start, but when you get to that point where you want to stop or take a break. How do you feel? How do your eyes feel? How does your head feel? And how does the page look? And I started to hear things like, things are changing on the page. Things aren't right. It's hard for me to see the page because it's flickering or flashing. They didn't know until we put them in the situation, made them read at that point they wanted to stop and have them then look at the page so they could tell us what was going on and report what was happening. So I have to thank all the adults <laughs> that worked with me um, at the four-year university for helping me discover Erlen. The interesting thing that all of you should know, so it's a big secret, maybe not, is I don't have Erlen. And I think if I, and I don't have it at all. I'm the person who reads for hours and hours. I can, I can finish a textbook in a day because I sit down in the morning and I read nonstop until nighttime. Um, school was a breeze for me. I got through things easy, quick, fast, and easy. I chunk read because everything on my page is so clear. I never read individual words. I see what's up ahead of me. I see what was behind me. I see what's coming up and what's in the past. So I read almost chunk reading. Gives you lots of information and really helps with comprehension. So I was playing off everything they told me against my experiences in life with reading. And then I had a group of graduate students who are professionals. They were all teachers. And they were also long-term proficient readers. And none of them experienced any of the distortions which are like optical illusions or physical symptoms with reading that were being reported. And I think if I had any of the symptoms, I would have dismissed it and just thought, well, I haven't and I've been successful, so all you need to do is try harder. But I didn't have any of the symptoms. And therefore, I believed them. And I wanted to make them just like me. <laughs> so. 
that's when we started out looking at how do we change things to make things stable and clear and comfortable so that their brain is calm, comfortable, relaxed, and they're able to do things quickly and easily. Um, and that's how we came up. I came up finally with the colored overlays. And then the adults were saying, oh yeah, this is wonderful. This is great for reading. But think about what's happening in our environment. Think about having to read things off of whiteboards, computer screens, and um, depth perception. And they just went on and on. And then I had to think, OK, if color works on the page, will it work if they wear color? And so that was a whole nother different way of dealing with it. Um, and I, I, so that's how this whole thing came about. Just that, that thought of we need to do things differently. We need to ask different questions in a different way. And I can't assume that the test thing we're doing now is identifying all those children and adults who are struggling and having problems. And then the other change was to ask them, just like you do when you see the doctor. The doctor doesn't just automatically do tests. The medical profession, after they get your insurance card, um, <laughs> asks you, how do you feel? What hurts? What's happening? They ask you for your opinion. In the educational system, we don't do that. But Erlen does that. So I see we have some other questions. Yes, Caitlin um, wants to know why, when her diagnostician tells her that she should be wearing her Erlen Spectral filters all the time, she finds that if she wears them all day, instead of just when she needs to read something, she actually is getting headaches. Is there a reason for this, and what should she do? Hi, Caitlin. I think you need to get back to your diagnostician and report this to that, your diagnostician who will bring you back in for a follow-up because the color should not work just with reading. The color needs to work in your environment. You need to make sure you test it for not just when you read, but in dim lighting, bright lights, outside, headlights at night, if it's really calming your brain down, the color you wear, and you may need a different color for a different environment. You know, sometimes it needs to be different. We have general use pair and outside pair. Some people can wear one pair all the time. So you may need a second pair, okay? It may be good for reading, but not giving you enough protection in terms of your environment. Get back to your diagnostician. Great. We got a question offline that came through. Will I ever grow out of Erlen syndrome to the point um, where my brain will change to the point where I don't need glasses anymore? Mm. I get asked that question all the time. It's a little bit hard for us to track because obviously the people who stop wearing it don't come back and tell us about it. I do know that um, when we were first doing the first pilot study, we had a population of about 15 adults at that time. And we still see those adults every year or every five years. And they're still wearing their Earl and Spectral filters. And even for some of them, their color has never changed over the years. Um, your environment can change. And therefore, you may not need your own spectral filters. Let me give you the example. Uh, we have adult, uh, children who were tested when they were children, given their own spectral filters. And then they got married, and they're stay-at-home moms, and their environment has changed, and they're not wearing their own spectral filters. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, we get emails from them saying, I wore my own filters as a child and now I'm working and the computer screens and the fluorescent lights are killing me. I need to come back in and get tested again for my own spectral filters. Um, so if your environment changes and it's no longer in this horrible toxic environment, you can control your environment. You work from home, you've controlled your lighting, you use more natural lighting. Um, then your early symptoms may be minimal or be minimized. Do they ever fully go away? Not typically. Um, can they be reduced? Yes, we see that in children. 
and a lot of times even with adults, that your brain is so stressed, if you're severe, by the time you come in to see us, that you get a color and a density. But that color and density, as your brain calms down, so does your need for the color that you're and density that you're wearing. So that your color changes and it can get lighter and lighter the more you wear it and the more you're calming your brain down. Great. Audrey wants to know how we can get Erlen more recognized. What research is going on right now? <sighs> okay. I ask that all the time. Probably it's my biggest frustration in life is why are we not recognized? Why is this not incorporated into the educational system? Why is this not even part of the literacy projects that are in the prison system? Because 81% of those prisoners have learning disabilities and 87% of that 81% have Erlen syndrome in the prison system. And you're gonna send them back out and they won't have the skills necessary. It is a huge frustration for me. Um, it's one of the reasons where we keep stressing the research, but even getting the research published gets difficult because it's not a recognized, um, it's not recognized and therefore the journals don't want to publish these types of research. They think, what about the brain? There's not enough information on the brain. What do you mean you're changing your brain? How does that affect people's lives? They just don't get that connection. We need people to be mobilized, to join us, to help talk about it. Um, we need to have the public, you know, I have to tell you the public is very powerful. I go way back and there was no such thing as special education classes. And it wasn't the educators who established them. It was the parents. It was the parents who demanded it. It was the parents that advocated. It was the parents that made the difference. That's why you have special education today. It's the parents. So we need a ground spell, groundswell of support um, from all of you and everyone you can talk to. And the more people that we have who are out there and supporting and advocating and talking about it, um, the more likely it is that we're going to create awareness and make a difference and make this part of the educational system so children don't become adults and find out about it. And as they say, where were you 30 years ago in my life? And I see a lot of very high performing adults who come in, which is interesting, high level executives, et cetera. Um, but they're putting out so much energy and extra energy and effort because they have Erlen and it's gonna affect them. So we see all types, but we need you. We'll keep doing the research and we'll keep talking, but we need you and we need your help. Our next question is from Lance. Um, he is a former Erlen uh, Spectra filter wearer. They helped him quite a lot, but at some point he couldn't afford them anymore. And he's wondering if there is any way to get help paying for them if you can't afford them. Um, Sandy, did you want to say anything or not? About that, I'll tell you one thing, um, that Lions Club will help with both the testing and paying for your glasses, frames, and lab fees. If you got a good story, contact your local Lions Club. There are some charities in the UK and a foundation in the US sometimes that has enough money to pay for, um, and help with the filters. And I realize that is a big issue. Okay, great. So I think that the answer is to contact an Erlen diagnostician because they may be able to direct you to some of those outside funding sources that are available. And yes, there are some both overseas as well as in the United States. Um, this is an interesting question from Lynette. Is the epileptic population also affected positively by Erlen filters? What we 
find is that, yeah, you know, again, talking about our toxic environment, all things that I mentioned can, can actually trigger certain things that look like epilepsy for certain people or make it worse. Um, so that we will see people who um, find that they're much more, obviously brain is much calmer, much more relaxed, and therefore there's a decrease in seizures. Some people get epileptic seizures from con different contrasts, like picket fences, black, white, black, white, that Erlen can control. So there are certain types of epileptic seizures that we can either reduce or control. Great. We have someone asking about screener training. Will there be any coming up in Eastern Europe in Romania? I think that you can find out the answer to on Erlen.com. There's always a list of upcoming screener workshops on the website. So Karina, go there. And contact. Um, yes, there are. And yes, there will be more. So we are working and we have um, people going over there, and we'll soon have a couple of diagnosticians in that area who will be, and we've already been doing a number of screener trainings, and we'll continue doing a number of screener trainings. So check, if you can't find anything, contact Alan Penn, P-E-N-N, -E in the UK. He's an Erlen diagnostician, and he has been going over there to do screener trainings. I think we have time for a couple more, one or two more questions. This is a great one from Hannah Miller. When is the next Erlen International Conference? She seems to know it's going to be in the United Kingdom. That's the decided <laughs> insider information, I think. Yeah. Hi, Hannah. Um, we actually got an email. I got an email last night saying that they've now signed the contracts for the venue and we definitely have the date. Um, and we would like Everyone listening, if you want to have a nice business write-off, come on over and join us um, for the conference. It's And we will be sending that information out to you. It's going to be in, in the summer. We'll be posting it. Um, and we have now a definite date and a definite year. It's going to be uh, 2019 for the next conference. And we already have other countries bidding for the following one, um, including the U.S. So <laughs> we'll see U.S. and the Middle East and different places have been bidding. So come, we always say join Erlen and see the world, okay? Wonderful. I think with that, if we didn't have a chance to get to your question today, um, we will be forwarding Helen, any of the leftover questions, if there are ones that um, can get responses to, we'll be sure to try and get those back to you, either via Facebook or um, in some other forum. We want to thank everyone for joining us today for this really extra special Erlen Syndrome Awareness Week event. Thank you, Helen. As always, it's incredibly enlightening to hear you speak um, and to have you just explain things in a way that makes it seem so clear and so obvious as to why all of this is going on for all of us out there who experience Erlen syndrome. Don't forget to uh, share this video. It will be accessible um, in recorded form for here to eternity on our Facebook page, and you'll be able to share the link with uh, anyone who wasn't able to make the live event here today. Um, and if you want more information about anything that's going on for the rest of this week as we wrap up Erlen Syndrome Awareness Week, please do visit Erlen.com and the I Saw webpage. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.